here was just an example that just stuck out to me is, you know, like this, this makes no sense, or he, he allegedly can't remember what would be the final conversation he had with his own wife. This would be, think about it. If you, if you have a loved one, a spouse who gets brutally murdered, you don't remember the last words you spoke to that person. Everyone remembers the last words they spoke to a dying loved one, whether it's by murder or another cause. But I would imagine, especially if it were a murder. Here's Sot 5. Did I say goodbye? Yeah. Did you talk to them at all, or did you just get the chicken, put it on there, jump on there, and just take off? I wouldn't have just gone off. I mean, I would have said, I'm leaving. Okay. Did I say goodbye or bye? And again, go ahead. I mean, there would have been some, you know, there there would have been some exchange. I'm not staying here. Well, what was that exchange? I mean, you have you've had such a photographic memory about these new stories. What 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 happened here? No, that's not. I can't tell you the exact words. You don't remember your conversation after you put that chicken up. Did y'all talk about the chicken? No, I don't think we did. Did you talk with Paul about Cash's tail after the chicken? Yeah. No, I, I know I didn't do that. Did you tell Maggie I'm going to go check on him? At that point, no, I don't. I don't did you think tell I did. Maggie oh, it's hot out here? If they gonna go back, I, I certainly would have said something to that effect. All right. I mean, Ronnie, really? No, no, it bothers you for the same reason it bothers me, and that is that is not truthful testimony. The, but the bigger question is, what is the jury hearing? You know. Has he connected with one, two, or more, like Mark seemed to believe? Um, when you see the techniques that he's using in answering questions, he recasts questions all the time, right? So I don't know, what do you mean by wealthy? I mean, I don't know, what do you mean by, um, you know, just constantly creating room for himself to maneuver by recasting the question, even here in this most important of all conversations ever, He's creating time and space for himself to think about it. You don't have to think about the last words that you said to your to your wife who's brutally murdered. And it's not believable. So if a jury believes he's lying about the most important fact in the case, and that's the fact that he was there minutes before the murders, then he has to be guilty. Mm-hmm. And even just like he's he's sort of lost the thread on when to cry. <laughs> you know, yeah. like he... He knows he should cry when he's talking about the condition of the bodies when he allegedly stumbled upon them innocently, not knowing what he was walking into. But an actual grieving relative would 100% be choked up in talking about the last moments they laid eyes upon their son and their wife literally four minutes before they were brutally murdered when you could have been there. Maybe you could have stopped it. You could like that's what a normal dad or spouse would be saying, like, my God. It, it would be emblazed in your brain, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you play this over in your head over and over again? Every movement, every glance, you know, every word that was spoken. I mean, if, if there are facts that should be cemented in this man's mind, it's that last interaction with the people who meant the most to him in the world. And yes. that he's fuzzy on those facts really doesn't play well at all. Yes, honestly, I, the audience knows I lost my sister, um, who's 58 years old, just this past October. And I, I mean, I remember every word I said to her when I got to that hospital. She couldn't, you know, necessarily hear me, but it doesn't matter. I remember every word I uttered in that hospital room where we were for hours. That, that kind of memory doesn't go away. It's no. seared in one's memory. You know you're losing somebody who's hugely important to you. and even if he didn't know he was about to lose Maggie and Paul, you go back and relive it. You know, you most people beat themselves up after they lose somebody suddenly due to murder, due to a car crash, and say like, why didn't I say I love them? I wish I had given them a hug. You know, like none of that, none of that. He's just weaselly all over the board. No, and, and I, I am in the past have lost a loved one to an act of violence. And I, I can tell you, I think mentally you're prepared to hear the news that maybe someone got sick or there was a terrible accident but you're not prepared to hear the news that someone died violently. And mm. it, it, it embosses on you. I mean, it, where you are, what, who you spoke to, what those words were, it, it imprints immediately and, and indelibly. So I don't buy at all that, that he's looking for the words 
that should be so imprinted in his mind. Especially if you were there moments before the act took place. Any normal family member would be saying, the number of hours I have beaten myself up for going back to the house. Why did I go back to the house? What if I had stayed there? Maybe I could have saved them. Maybe I would have seen the killer. You know, none of that. He's not He's not emotionally in tune enough to realize this is a whole thread that actual grieving family members would be mired in. And there was an important admission, I thought. It was the only moment I've seen him on the stand, Ronnie, where he didn't seem to get that he was giving them a good admission. He, he's been two steps ahead of them for most of the cross. But in this one moment, he didn't seem to realize what he was admitting when the prosecutor was asking him about whether the dogs at the kennels were acting strangely as if potentially a stranger was there. Because of course, what, the, what he's setting up is, under your new story, sir, you left. And like two minutes later, after you left, they were murdered. And so somebody didn't just pop up at the kennels or on the Mazelle property within those two minutes. Like that person would have had to be there. And this is how Alec Murdoch handled the, the, the questions about the dogs at Sat Tu. Were the dogs barking and carrying on or going out into the woods or acting like they sensed somebody was around that they didn't know? Were the dogs acting like there was somebody around that they didn't know? Yeah, like dogs do. No. The, no, they there, weren't. There was nobody there was no around dog. that the dogs didn't know. Okay. Dogs didn't, didn't, to your indication, sense anything out of the ordinary. They were just chasing after the guinea. There was nobody else around. All right. Good. For them to, to, to sense. What did you make of that? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm from here, and I don't know for the broader audience that they can appreciate just how remote this place is. I mean, this is this is as rural South Carolina as you can make it. Um, there's some backwaters. There's some farms. I mean, there is nothing out there. And people who do have dogs or kennels, I mean, they're out there for a reason. If, if anything moves, I mean, they're, they're raising hell out there. And... It, it's an experience that the, the jurors here would would understand. Also, this family in that community, you know, if a, if a squirrel farts in Hampton, I mean, the, the Murdaws know about it. So the the idea that two unknown assailants could have slipped into Mazelle in the middle of the night, undetected, and been there coincidentally just minutes after Alex leaves the area and shoots and kills Maggie and Paul with weapons that were from the residents is so outlandishly, it, it's it's hitting the lottery while getting struck by lightning. I, and mm -hmm. to me, I hope that's what the, the prosecution ultimately conveys to the jury, how unlikely it could be that it's anybody other than Alex. Mm -hmm. He... Um... Yeah, and when they, I hope they are better at closing than they are at crossing. That's my one big hope. Like when you've got your yeah. cross, because the the best way to do a cross examination, and I, I was watching it thinking they should have, they needed to pull an all nighter and they didn't, because you never ask a question you don't know the answer to, and you right. say, Mr. Murdoch, you previously told law enforcement that you took a nap. We've gone back and checked. We can't find him saying an hour, we, which, as the prosecutor said, I'm trusting the guy that that's what Alex said at some point. We do. We have it. Hold on. Listen to my team. Here, let's play what we do have. Here's, where, here's what we heard Alex saying, 25 minutes. It's definitely longer than may or may be not napped. I can't be sure. I might have napped a short dose, whatever. He used to say 25 minutes. Here's what we have. I, uh, I was up at the house. I laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably... I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up, I called Maggie. Okay, so you and I both know a skilled prosecutor has that at the ready. And they say, yeah. yesterday you told this jury that you may or may not have napped. Your, your news story is you don't, you don't know if you napped. Isn't it true you told law enforcement moments after the alleged murder, you napped for 25 to 30 minutes? Yes, it is. In fact, here you are telling law enforcement, let the jury see it. And then let him lie right on the back end of it. Like at every turn, you should be doing that to underscore 
what a liar he is, and on big details and small. Yeah, you you have to wonder. I, certainly, they anticipated he would testify, but m- maybe not. You know, maybe you would want those first 10, 15, 20 questions to be just hit, stick, move, no room for wiggle from Alex Murdoch. Hit with your best punches first. And, and to your point, there should be nothing more than room to say yes or no. And if he says anything else, he's going to look like the liar that he is. But mm-hmm. that's not the way the prosecution came out of the box. Now, it's it's more of a grind. Um, but I think you got to capture that jury immediately and hit with your best, best punch fast. One of our sponsors today is Donors Trust, a principled, tax-friendly way to simplify your charitable giving. Cancel culture doesn't just affect comedians and commentators anymore. It also affects everyday hardworking Americans. How? Well, it derails their charitable giving, believe it or not. Take Jeannie's story, for example. Jeannie did her charitable giving through one of these big national donor-advised fund providers. That is, until, without a clear reason, it refused to send her money, her charitable dollars, to a conservative nonprofit. Can you imagine how mad you'd be? She writes in, I'm a conservative. I believe America's great despite her imperfections and that capitalism brings great good to society rather than government. Earlier this year, I requested another gift from my donor-advised fund and it was rejected. Jeannie wanted a donor-advised fund that shares her conservative principles and she found it in Donors Trust, the oldest and largest donor-advised fund committed to limited government. Do you want a principal partner helping you support causes close to your heart? If so, consider opening a donor-advised fund with Donors Trust. For more info on how Donors Trust can help, visit donorstrust.org slash MK, D-O-N-O-R-S trust.org slash MK to receive a free copy of their donor prospectus, donorstrust.org slash MK. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.